Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 439, featuring the first in the new series with Annie Vandermeer. Uh, in this episode, Annie talks about her latest game, Passenger, uh, and then gets into Panic at Multiverse High and a bunch of other stuff related to uh, writing uh, for games, adventure games, visual novels, game endings, character arcs, and much, much more. I think you're really going to like this, so without further ado, here is Annie Vandermeer. <laughs> yeah, every about every twenty minutes or so, I like to start a new file just to kind of keep it from getting too. It's like saving a game almost. You don't want to go too long without saving. Absolutely. I mean, I've, I've had friends run podcasts and do different things, and they didn't save periodically. And sometimes they're like, "Yeah, so bad news." <laughs> All interviews gone. Remember that boss you just barely managed to kill? Yeah, uh, you're gonna be doing that again. <laughs> <laughs> so some good news first. You did a great job. The bad news is you get to do it again. <laughs> Maybe you'll do better. But it's okay because you're much better at it now. <laughs> yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> All right, I'm just gonna read this intro, and if you like okay. it, we'll just keep moving. Cool. If you, want make, if you want to fix it, we could do it again. You know, this isn't live or anything, so it's fine. Whoop. All right, folks, I am here with Annie Vandermeer. Uh, she's an RPG designer who's worked on some really great games. She did Neverwinter Nights 2, Storm of Zaire, Guild Wars 2, Dead State, Panic at Multiverse High. Uh, she's been a regular guest speaker at all sorts of uh, gaming expos and conventions, and she's covered some great topics I hope we'll get into here. I just read you a couple of the titles of these these talks in way of a teaser. The Agony and the Ecstasy of RPG Writing, Real Feels, Crafting Meaningful Relationships in Games, and she's even done one about humor. Called That's it, that's the joke. Humor games and humorous humor games and humorous games. <laughs> uh, so there's a lot to unpack here, but I was thinking, Annie, uh, well, first of all, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks. How about you? <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, I thought I would start with discussing your the current project that you're working on, uh, The Passenger. Yeah, uh, that has been a, uh, a personal project for a while. I started it right after uh, wrapping Pan uh, Panic at Multiverse High because uh, I was stu still noodling around with RenPy. Uh, which is what I put together Panic in, and um, I had a sort of personal goal for myself to be less scared of scripting and uh, wanting to put something together. And I had initially been collaborating with some other people, and then it sort of became a solo project. And the more I looked at it, the more I was like, I think that the only thing I can do to actually make this come out ever is do all the art myself. And I had... Uh, been hugely inspired working with the pixel artist uh, Paul Conway, aka Doom Cube, who you should absolutely look up because his Doom work Cube. Is, his work is phenomenal. He's one of those artists that makes you like rethink things. Like the stuff he could do with 48 pixels would blow your mind. Um, he actually kind of went viral for something he did where he did like a scene from The Thing as if it came from a LucasArts adventure game. So people oh. would know that. But yeah, inspirational. So I was like, I'll try to do pixel art. So that's all me and my crazy pixel art for the game. Um, but great. yeah, it, it, it basically became this sort of personal challenge that I was like, maybe I should actually put this out. And recently I got some uh, encouragement uh, from some good friends and was like, okay, yeah, I'm going to do it. So officially speaking, it came out uh, January 1st, 2020. So it is out and accessible now. It's just a pay what you want kind of thing. Uh, and I want to make sure i am uh, got time set aside to like fix bugs and do little quality of life upgrades and things like that. So it's crazy. I don't think it's quite, well, it's been less than a day, but I don't think it's quite sunk in yet. Like, hey, that thing you were working on, you know, for years, it's out now. Yeah. Like, for better or worse, it's out. So Is it kind of hard to let go of a game project like that? Or do you feel kind of, oh, I don't know if I'm quite ready Oh, Lord. Yeah. Uh, my friend Mike Stout said it's a wonder that any games ever get made because even before um, when it was like you would actually put out a physical copy of a thing and it would be done, you were still doing patches. But like even then it was just like, no, I just I have 
there's a bug. <laughs> you get stressed about it. Now with the concept of games as a service, nobody's ever done with the game. I think games aren't done ever. They're just yeah. released. Yeah, I see so, that sometimes. Yeah. Something. As I was doing some research for this interview, even like games that are decades old at this point, you'll still see reviews like, when are they going to update this again? Or when are they going to be a patch for this? I'm like, you know, I don't I don't imagine anybody on that team. <laughs> you know, who even knows if they're still working in the industry or working on that particular game? But yeah, yeah that's a people, fun topic. Yeah, people sometimes are like, oh, man, the devs abandoned Dead State. So like, no, it's yeah. it's done. The game is done. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's done is a term that I think uh, gamers don't really click with, and developers don't either. We're we're two of a kind in that sort of regard. We're just like nothing's quite done. It is just at the state it's in. Well, sometimes I notice that the fans themselves will come together and have like a community patch and update things. I always think that's wonderful. I mean, it's it's finally somebody that's got tired of complaining about something and has just kind of stepped up and like the heck with it, I'll do it, you know. <laughs> yeah, that that blows my mind. I'm always so touched by things like that. That's like, really? Dude, that's, that was complicated. There were some mean bugs in there, and you... Thank you! That's yeah, great! Yeah, we'll hire you for the next project. Right? <laughs> so there's a... You know, you talked about some of the inspirations of in of the passenger in the game itself. We'll get into that. I think that's a really cool aspect of it, by the way. But you said you uh, Doctor Who came up in there episode of doctor i'm not going to mention the particular episodes because i don't want to spoil the uh spoil the game for you but doctor who firefly now, i was thinking about some other things too the uh, choose your own adventure books which i a lot i don't know if you saw it i actually had r.a montgomery on the show way back uh, before he passed away and yeah, just amazing guy you know amazing series but uh that seems to be an inf influence to me uh we were just talking a little bit about some of the old lucasfilm stuff sierra stuff uh, just wondering what all inspired, uh, or were you inspired by those? Is there some um, other stuff? I think, yeah, absolutely. I um, was actually one of those weird people who played more Sierra games back in the day. I came into Lucas Arts games, Lucas Films games, uh, like a little later. And by later, I mean teenage years. But yeah, absolutely an inspiration. Um, and uh, I. I devoured Choose Your Own Adventures back in the day. I was also probably not the only kid that kept the like finger in the book at one point to like look oh, ahead. Oh, cheated! <laughs> I made a save game. Made is what save, I did. A save game. <laughs> I did the same thing. I think I had save. multiple bookmarks going at some point. Yeah, I like. I. I mean, I think. Yeah, that was probably one of my first encounters with a a branching narrative, really, and I wanted. Uh, I wanted something like that. I wanted something that was also like of a manageable size uh, that actually had a kind of greater spread in the, the possibility of endings. Like the path through the game may be a lot more similar, but where you end up is totally different. Um, one of the things that I wish I'd done with Panic was make the, the endings a lot more distinct from one another and your sort of choice of best friend to stand out more. Mm -hmm. Again, no game is ever really done. Uh, but so I, I resolved to do something much more like that with passengers to make uh, each of the endings sort of stand out significantly depending on the sort of character class you pick and the choices you make throughout the game. Um, but yeah, another inspiration, which I'll, I'll just spoiler alert, uh, a friend of mine actually took a container ship from Japan to the US and something about that experience of just sort of being peripheral to the point of this voyage uh, really intrigued me. Like, you're just sort of there. You're this anomaly. And the crew is just around doing their things because so much of, like, how we travel is everything is catered to us. And also for games, too. Like, you, you are the sole focus. You yeah. are the chosen one. To have something where it's like, well, you're the only one here. <laughs> yeah, that <laughs> really comes something. across so well in the game. That was one of the things that really struck me was when they're... I guess the captain is sort of going over the intercom and saying, are, you know, are you on board? And it says in the text something like, you're kind of surprised to hear your name mentioned. And for some reason that sort of resonated with me. And like, yeah, it's all, I can, you know, I can totally, uh, you know, I know what that's like. Yeah. That sort of quick moment of like, uh, present. Why did I say present? I'm not in elementary <laughs> school. Yeah. I think you, you really nailed it in this game. It, it to me, it felt like, 
you know, there's, there's a sort of sweet spot where you're playing something and you're like, this is reminding me of like those great Apple II games and all that stuff. It's sort of scratching that itch, but it's not, it's only the good parts, right? You're not, you didn't include like the the part, we forget about the crappy stuff, you know, like all <laughs> the, the stuck, getting stuck and the, well, you know, the... <laughs> <laughs> and we didn't have game facts. And we didn't, like, they. the most you had was, like, helplines for some games. Like the Sierra helpline or the LucasArts oh, yeah. helpline or the Nintendo helpline. Nintendo and that was, help like, line. I remember looking at those as a kid at, like, I paid attention to the X dollars a minute. And I'm like, my parents will murder me if I call. And they look at the phone bill and be like, and what's this? What did you spend $12 on? Like, well... <laughs> funny story i was super stuck at this point and okay i'm grounded all right cool yeah, well, <laughs> my parents are wonderful people but they would have gotten irked my <laughs> co-author shane stacks he's he was actually on a first name basis with one of those persons from the nintendo hotline back in the day <laughs> called so much <laughs> oh, parents man. Must just love that <laughs> actually a friend of mine uh jeff from penny arcade callus uh used to work for the nintendo hotline really? and I still need to bug him for stories from that. Like, oh man, <laughs> gotta have good ones. Just be constantly enthusiastic. Like, well, buddy, let me help you. When people have been like, obviously banging their head against this thing for hours is like, any helpline is daunting. Mm-hmm. Um, but, oh boy. <laughs> you gotta hope that you're actually getting a kid calling with that sort of moderated frustration and not an adult who's like, okay, time for the swears. <laughs> oh, yeah, I can imagine. I'm kind of curious about this genre, uh, Annie. It's not something I'm personally familiar with. I mean, I am for graphical adventure games, but we're, we're talking here about visual novels. I was doing some research on that term, and I've had a... I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing this. I'll just maybe spell it. <laughs> o- <laughs> maybe you can pronounce it. O-T-O-M-E? Otome. Otome. Uh, so I'm... Those are- Oops, sorry, you go. <laughs> well, I, well, maybe maybe it's not a familiar term. That's just what Wikipedia was saying. Like visual novels, also known as otome, maybe by the <laughs> some people call it that. Uh, anyway, I just wonder, can you talk a little bit about this genre? Like, what makes this genre different than other genres? And maybe get into like uh, Passenger and Panic and where those fit in. Absolutely. Like, uh, so. Uh, I, I have friends at the, the site, Ladies Playing Indies, and I it was just sort of, oh, let's play Howdiful Boyfriend on a stream. And that game is ludicrous. Uh, you are a human at a school full of, of birds. And something about, I mean, like the the getting involved in the sort of comedy of this game and the, the sort of experience of playing through it... Um, the weird thing was playing through it with multiple people and doing the different voices and that sort of sense of like collaboration is not, you know, obviously not a requirement of how the game is played, but it actually reminded me of how I played uh, point and click adventures as a kid. I played that with my cousins and friends. Like we had little roles that helped us sort of through the game and helped in situations when we were stuck. But there was so much ludicrousness and comedy to that game um, I mean, there were points, just like you mentioned with the the classic games, there were things that I really liked, and then things about it that I was like, this could be improved upon. Um, and as somebody who, I, mean, I consider myself a designer first and foremost, but I also really love to write. Uh, and I think that it's hard to, it's hard to do humor games, like to the point where I was like, I'm going to do a PAX panel about it. Uh, they're just not common because humor is a hard thing to sort of nail down with a wider appeal. So for Panic, I was like, I mean, that that started out as supposed to be a sort of side story to uh, Panic in the Multiverse, which is another game that Double Bear was working on. It was it started it sort of started out as a lark, a like let's do a mock of this. A lot of Otome games are like, oh, they're romantic and they're set in a high school and everything. I like the ludicrousness of it being set in a high school, and uh, I wanted to make a game about friendship. I'm the sort of sucker that really loves uh, friendship as it's portrayed in certain shows is like, this is, it's fun. It's, they're much harder to write than a sort of romance. Like uh, Leslie and Anne in Parks and Rec is like, that's, that's a great best friendship. That is so much fun for me to watch. Like I like buddies. So I wanted to have a game about that. And um, it was actually, to me that that was a parody game. And 
it's hard to do parody because on a certain level, you actually have to do a good version of the thing that you're doing a parody of. Like, Hot Fuzz is legitimately an amazing action movie, and it's making fun of action movies. So I was like, okay, I need to do the Hot Fuzz of Hotome games? I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, it was something where I was like, what about this is good? What about this mechanically takes too long? And um, I wanted to carry that through in The Passenger because I wanted to do like a more serious version. And I also wanted to see how well I could blend it with you know, the point and click with, um, with actual puzzles and so on. And to challenge myself to be like, make a fun, small puzzle. That's real hard. <laughs> a lot of them are very similar because like, it's, it is genuinely extremely difficult to come up with a nice, crunchy, you know, easy to learn lifetime to master kind of puzzle. Like, that's not easy. <laughs> that's why I just some of the, on. some of the classics in there, the towers of, was it the towers of Hanoi? Hanoi? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm talking and, about, right? The little yeah. And, well, you designed it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to straight up. Is that the like, name of that I, type of puzzle? Oh, yeah, that's the one. I like that was code that was very helpfully supplied by the RenPy community, um, uh, which is another reason I was like, I want to make this game like donation focused uh, because I got so much help from this, this very uh, small but extremely um, focused on helping each other kind of community. And, uh, I hope I gave back too, because like the, there are things in there, like there's a keypad puzzle and oh, there's yeah, a the bookend, pipe. evens bookend odds. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. I spent quite a, uh, quite a time studying those uh, clues. <laughs> let me tell you. Oh, I hope it wasn't too frustrating. I was always trying to find a like median level of like, um, can you figure this out within a decent amount of time where if you if people get really frustrated, can they back out and try something different um, and evaluating that? But like it was so simple to, to like or the, the the pipe dream style puzzle in it is really it's really small and simple. And like I really love that type of puzzle. But I thought about if I make this even like one section larger, that will take me. 10 times the work. It's the sort of thing where, like, I'm sure anybody could look at my scripting and being who knew what they were doing and be like, this is a mess. <laughs> you could do this so much more efficiently. But it's like, I wanted to do it. Uh, it meant something to me to do it. And also art, too. I'm sure any artist would be like, yeah, no, no to all of this. Or like, you, how long did it take you to do this? Like, oh, yeah, if you just did this, it would take you like a quarter of the time. Like, I don't know these tricks. Tribal. <laughs> Those like they say the best code is the code that works, right? Yeah, <laughs> I have made. There's so much, so many beautiful kludges in, uh, <laughs> in the script for that game. A friend of mine was trying to tell me, like, uh, "Oh yeah, it'd be really cool if you could set up this this animation or this scene like so." And I did this kind of like pain wince smile, and I was like, "If I showed you how I had to put together the animations." For that game, all like one long list of of files and like timing, you would fall over like in disgust. It's ridiculous. <laughs> I just sort of got myself set into it. Like, well, I know how to do it this way. <laughs> like side project, side project. Mm. <laughs> and one thing I'm kind of interested in is the focus here on the multiple endings. And I've talked to some other designers about this too, and they they talk about how it's a little bit. I guess a little bit stressful almost designing a long game with multiple endings because you don't, most people probably aren't going to go back and play a very long game. <clears throat> I mean, the, the super fans will. You know, oh, yeah. You're, you're putting in all that content for, you know, very, very few, you know, people. So I think it's really smart what you did to have a game that's not so long, you know, so it is possible to go back and, you know, play it three or four times to see those endings. Mm -hmm. Like, I, uh, I will admit that my failure with with Panic High was that the whole purpose of the game was to build relationships and I didn't pay them off as much as I wanted to in the end and going like, uh, you know, people may not play this through 20 times, but they want to sort of see the, the choices that they made through the game have a little bit more impact. And I think that having the different endings a lot of times is not as much about uh, playing through the game actually those multiple times, but mm -hmm. talking to someone else who's played through things and gone like, oh, your, different one, your ending was totally different from mine, or going, 
in that ending, I feel like the choices that I made throughout the game were reflected and and paid off properly. And like, I think for longer games, it's also more difficult because there are so many more choices. And it's like, what kind of weight do you give them? When do you pay these things off? If you if you do something cool in Act One, you really don't want to wait till the ending to see. Oh yeah, because then you're like wait, who is that guy? And yeah. all this sort of emotional impact is lost. Like, oh no, this tragic end. Like, to who? who was, that? <laughs> was that the guy with the hair? No. Okay, whatever. <laughs> like, on with the yeah, next. I know. So on the same page with that. I, mean, some, I feel like sometimes games are getting a little too much. Maybe they've been too inspired by something like Game of Thrones or oh, some yeah. of the comics out there where there's just so much going on. You're just like, I can't keep track of all this. I feel like I need to have a, some kind of book like I need to be taking notes during the uh, while I'm watching this. It's just too much. Yeah, I actually one of the evolutions I've seen in a couple of RPGs that I was like, okay, that's pretty brilliant. And actually, it showed up in Persona Five. Is like there's little glossaries and a little like story so far kind of thing. It can yeah. detect the chapter you're on, and they're like, this is what's going on. You're like, oh, okay, cool. I haven't yes. played this game for seven months because yeah, exactly. life happened. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so I mean, it's a it's a sort of I think there's, there's, you know, as, as games change, I think also in that we get, we as designers and developers get a lot more feedback very actively from communities. We're sort of being better at anticipating uh, the sort of needs of the player and, and uh, you know, focusing on some good quality of life kind of changes. Like, Okay, yeah, I know that that things happen. Like, here's a little update, so you you can jump back in, and it's not so daunting. You don't feel inclined to just go, ah, forget it. I have no idea what I what I'm doing or where I am, kind of thing. Like, we want to keep you invested because we made a thing, and I hope you like it. Mm-hmm. One of the things about this, uh, one last thing about the passenger, I think is I really want to explore here. It almost felt like it was a as much for your. As much for other designers and writers as for just casual players, right? Especially getting, because you included like director's commentary, for lack of a better word. I guess that'd be developer, designer commentary, whatever you want to call it. And you kind of go, you kind of break down like what your intentions were and how you tried to implement those. So is that kind of, do you see that as, was that sort of the intention was to design something that's kind of a lesson about game design? (laughs) Am I just reading too much into it? I think I think you have me there. I think I think partly yes. I think I'm also I well I no I know I'm also that I am that dork who wants the Blu-rays of every movie she likes because yeah I watch I listen to the commentary I love the behind the scenes stuff I always loved that and um, when I was younger I I yearned for that for games like I I felt kind of troubled that. Um, Game development was something that was so much behind closed doors, and that it wasn't how to how to do it. The the sort of principles of it were were pretty restricted. Like you just didn't you didn't get to see that a whole bunch. Uh, and the few sort of exceptions, like Ratchet and Clank, which thank you, Mike Stout, my friend, for making those, uh, and and so on. I just ate up any of that that I could. And now we have incredible uh, behind the scenes stuff like yourself and like two player productions and no clip. And like, we're actually talking to developers and we're seeing development and we're hearing about these things. Like young, me would have gone bonkers over this. Uh, I mean, me right now is going bonkers over it, but um, yeah, I wanted that to sort of exist as a kind of companion piece for, for hopefully for other developers, um, like maybe for fans, uh, and yeah, for me too. <laughs> yeah, I agree. That's one of the reasons I wanted to do a show like this. And the reason that got me into it was that very same impulse. I mean, you talk to somebody like, well, who's your favorite bands? And do you know the names of the band members? You know, of course they do. Or, you know, yeah. what about your favorite movies and shows? You know, the like who wrote those uh, episodes? Maybe, you know, they probably do in mm-hmm. most cases. But you get the games and, they, you know, people don't know one designer. Or yeah. They can't mention anybody associated with it. I mean, it's really tragic. Mm -hmm. And it's also the sort of methodology of making games is like, I think your average person probably like knows how a song is written and recorded or like knows how a movie is made is like, well, it's not done in order. And, you know, scenes are done on different days. And like, because certain things are have been talked about for so long, they've been out for so long, or they're so transparent. And the game industry has been particularly opaque. 
Uh, and I have different theories about like why that's been for a long time. It's sometimes a very messy process. Like whenever you intersect like creativity and, um, and business stuff, it's sometimes a harmonious marriage and sometimes fraught. Uh, but yeah, I'm just glad that for, for whatever reason it's happening now, <laughs> like this is going on now. And I think that those people out there who are like, I want to know how this gets made. I want to know how these things happen. Now they have options. Now they can watch things and, and listen to, to interviews and see making ofs. And like, uh, it's neat when they're, it's neat when they're peripheral to game that they just are out there. But the idea of that being included in the game too, like as part of that medium also, I think acknowledges games are, um, you know, to, to whatever degree, um, for whatever level of success or intention, they are a medium, or they're an artistic medium. So it, it's like a little legitimacy to it, I guess. And now that you mentioned it, I'm thinking that there's a lot of movies about making movies. Or they show, they're they showing you like the how they do it, right? That's part of the story. And same thing with, with songs. And I, I can think of a few songs where they're talking about like being in a band. Like smoke on the water, you know. If you listen to the lyrics, it's about how they made the, <laughs> you know, how they made the song. Um, I'm trying to think games, where you see the game making process. I mean, there's a f maybe maybe you could come up with a few titles. I'm thinking there's that one. It's like that game uh, simulator, game development simulator, something like that from a while back. Oh yeah, I I played a phone game that was like game dev simulator that was kind of. Uh like adorable and like a little connected with things like oh what you know console are you gonna put it out on and what are you gonna make your own engine and uh different like levels of specialty uh but that was very abstracted i really love that there was another one where if you pirated the game you eventually lose because somebody's been pirating your game uh that was very on the nose a moment of honest reflection oh yes <laughs> This is you. That's what you did. Um, the, the games I know about that are ostensibly about the process of making games. I mentioned the word fraught before. They're hyper fraught. They're, uh, I think, uh, forgive me for, for getting the titles wrong. I think it's the player does something. These are like twine games and they are, uh, they're written by some very talented, extremely frustrated developers <laughs> focusing on the sort of that hugely difficult intertwining of business and game and the sort of parts where it's like if like that was your only sort of experience of like looking into how games are made you'd be like why does anybody do this it sounds terrifying but like it's it's also something that's that's like hard to get across i mean there's lots of experiences that i'm like if i could figure out how to to put this in a game to have this be something interactive and yet still fun because mm -hmm. um, interactive doesn't necessarily equal fun as we know from many bad games we've probably all played in the past ah, yes. um, <laughs> like i would i would love to do that but um i i uncovered a very sardonic thing i said back in 2016 which was i can't wait to make a game about this experience that no one will ever play and it's like oh sardonic annie <laughs> Like that's that was me, and I was mean to myself. But but yeah, the, the the making a game about making games is inherently difficult. I think also because there's so much in games. There's there's just a lot of ground to cover for for everything, for audio, for the quality of art, for all these different things. And I think that I think that the experience of making a game can be quite different depending on your department. Even like I have had titles that I, I loved working on, but the art department was like, screw everything. I am, I've, I'm like crunching like crazy. You guys have ridiculous demands. And then, you know, reverse sort of thing. Like it's all a sort of point by point experience. Uh, so yeah, how to do that best is a big question mark, but I like seeing it when people try <laughs> or, or, or do their take on it. I should say not try, they do to be all Yoda about it. <laughs> That's all for this week's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that. 
I uh, should be back. We'll see about next week. Hopefully, I'm going to try to keep these episodes coming out. It's, uh, you know, as I said, I'm, uh, the semester is sort of settling into a groove at this point. Uh, but, you know, things do happen sometimes that take up the time uh, that I would normally work on this show. So thank you for being patient. And thank you uh, very, very, very extremely, extremely much for supporting this show, for keeping these episodes coming. I could not, I would not do it without you uh, so thanks so much for your support uh if for whatever reason you've been holding off <laughs> not wanting to commit oh, uh, just you know check out that link go to the patreon site it's really easy you know buck a show it's really all i ask if you want to put in if you want to put in more that's fine it's up to you uh, just how much you like the show what's it worth to you uh, that's all i ask i think you'll uh, like the show a lot better uh, if you do support it and plus you'll be you know, doing your part. So thank you uh, very much for that. Also to the folks who uh, retweet and tweet and put things up on uh, Facebook and <laughs> uh, the various uh, RPG uh, forums. I really appreciate that. So thank you as well. All right, let's see. What about that news from the Matt character? All right, quite a bit of news here. First off, uh, Polygon's Michael McWhorter, Wizards of the Coast, also known as Watsy, I think oh, Wizards of the Coast has a bit more dignitas, as it were, but Watsy. Uh, so they're teaming up with some Bioware veterans, uh, calling themselves Archetype Entertainment. Uh, that's James Olin and Chad Robertson, if you're curious, uh, to create a new sci-fi RPG. Now tell me if this sounds like anything you've ever heard before. Uh, this will be, quote, set in an all-new science fiction universe that will send players on a story-driven epic where choices they make will have real consequences on how their story unfolds, also known as your choices matter. <laughs> uh, this is going to be set outside of the normal, or outside of the D&D magic franchises, what the hell? You know, what's the point, Watsy? <laughs> You're sitting on all these licenses. <laughs> Why don't you let your own studio tap into it? I don't get it. Anyways, looking at the comments on this, a lot of people are, you know, poking fun at this. You know, how many the choices matter? Come on, Bioware. Uh, or, Arch oh, I'm sorry, Archetype Entertainment. Um, other people just excited, you know, if, it, if this does turn out to be another kind of Mass Effect style game. Uh, that would be just fine. And I agree with that. I like the Mass Effect games. <laughs> you know, I, I like those, uh, you know, I like the combat and the characters in those games. Uh, anyway, moving on, Adam Dayton, good friend of the show, probably one of the oldest friends of the show. Uh, he wrote in about this game about vampires. It's called Vampires Fall Colon Origins. It's a 2D open world RPG with tactical combat. Create your character, choose your bloodline, and venture out into the world. Will you wreck, wreck havoc in the land, or be the hero people are longing for? Uh, let's see, I was looking for the town of this. I didn't write down the name of the studio <laughs> made the game, but it's uh, as of this uh, announcement here, it is 20% off on Steam, which makes it about $10.46 if memory serves. So go check that out. Looks like a pretty good Diablo clone to me. Uh, oh, uh, Adam says it has a JRPG flavor to it. So that, that's a good thing or a bad thing, depending on your uh, point of view. And let's see, Matt Workola, you know, if you are having uh, financial trouble, if you want a little extra cash, maybe to support great YouTubers like, you know, a certain Matt Chat, uh, but you can't afford to, uh, well, your problems may be <laughs> solved. <laughs> Uh, if you have an Xbox, and if you're willing to find bugs. Uh, so let's see, Zero Day, Catlin, uh, Catalin Simpano wrote about this. Uh, Microsoft Security Response Center is accepting vulnerabilities to its Xbox gaming platform. Uh, so you can't just find a bug and say, look, here's a bug. Uh, they have a procedure, some reports, you have to, some paperwork, I guess, you have to fill out that to be able to replicate the bug on their end, pretty standard stuff for this sort of thing. 
Uh, but the cool thing is you can get up to $20,000 you know, if you find something really sort of mission critical. Uh, but even like low-level stuff is uh, worth $500. Uh, so I think that's pretty cool. You know, sometimes I come across bugs. I don't know if that would <laughs> uh, qualify. Uh, but, yeah, it's kind of cool, you know, uh, a nice way to earn some income. And let's see, a couple other things. Uh, one is there's a new Nancy Drew game on the loose, on the prowl. And my wife and I have been playing this one. It's uh, Nancy Drew Midnight in Salem. It's all about witches. <laughs> <laughs> this, this, the Witch Trials. Uh, not quite finished with it yet, about eight hours in. It's uh, right around $22 on Steam. And this is, you know, it's been several years since the last one came out. I don't remember the title of that one off the top of my head. Uh, but I was wor getting worried they were just never going to come out with this new one. Uh, finally, it has arrived. Uh, the reviews are somewhat negative for it. You know, I don't know quite know what's up with that. Uh, people talking about bugs and such. Uh, I haven't we haven't encountered any, any. It's played just fine. Uh, so I have some more to say once I'm actually, uh, once we, we're actually through the game. Uh, I will say just off the top, though, it is very dialogue heavy. Uh, it seems like they put a lot, they've sort of upped the dialogue and lessened or made fewer puzzles. Uh, so I'm not very happy with that. <laughs> also, what's up with this light? <laughs> oh, one of those days. Uh, okay. Um, I also have some new copies of Dungeons and Desktops. You know, I did some reviews for the publisher, so in, <laughs> as a reward for that, they sent me the a couple copies of my book uh, so I could sell these on eBay. Uh, so I will sign those for you, ship them with a coin, with a collectible bag, and, uh, you know, it's a nice little thing to have. If you like, uh, even if you have a book, maybe you want to give that one to a friend so you can have the signed copy with the coin. Uh, it's up to you, but, you know, those are up on eBay. I've only got... Uh, three, I, I'm pretty sure there's still three left, but if you're interested, you really have to act quickly because they go fast. All right, then one last thing I just thought I would throw out. Uh, I am teaching one of those courses I'm just taught, <laughs> telling you about is a game studies course called uh, English 280, Understanding Video Games. Uh, I, I am making videos for that course, lectures, uh, with PowerPoints, no less, and they are on uh, a different account. Uh, than my standard Matt Chat account. So if you're, if you're curious, you know, it's not for everybody. It's not it's not Matt Chat, but you know, if that's if you think you might be interested, uh, I'll put a link in the show notes so you can check those out. You know, you're more than welcome to watch the videos and uh, comment on them or what have you. All right, whew, let's wrap this up with a quote. And I was looking for quotes by our old uh, friend. I'm very sad that he's 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 gone on now. He's passed away, but I did have him on this show. Uh, pretty early on in Mad Chat, uh, R.A. Montgomery, uh, the creator of the Choose Your Own Adventure series. Uh, so we talked a little bit about him. So I was looking for quotes. And, of course, you know, he's got lots of quotes you could find. Uh, I thought this one was cool. It's from his uh, book, Chinese Dragons. It goes something like this. Sometimes you think that there are several people inside you. One brave, one cowardly, one intelligent, and another who's a fool. You don't seem to be able to control which one it is who takes command of the situation. Well, Laurie Montgomery for you. Uh, anyway, hope you guys enjoyed that, and see you next time.
Rangers? That's original. How can you pluralize the Lone Ranger? What's wrong with that? Well, there's three of you. You're not exactly lone. Shouldn't you be the three Rangers? No idea what you're saying right now.